So anyways, I applied the loads, applied the bounding conditions. I got my analysis run. I sent him a plot, and I said, this is where it's breaking. He said, yep. Now what do we do? I loved that job. That was an amazing job. It was challenging. I was scared. You know, I was, oh, did I get it right? You know, didn't know, you know. But it was good because it actually put us both in a comfort zone. We both agreed that my analysis was right. We both then knew that whatever I came up with as a solution might be right as well. See how valuable that was for both of us? And I had confirmation. You know, he, he said, yeah, that's what it's. I, I mean, it was a really brilliant process. So in the end of that, then I, I, I went back to monocoque design for him because he kept adding, um, what's the solution that you normally go to when something's breaking steel-wise? What do you do? Go to alloy or thicken it, yeah. What, but you're in the field, you're fixing it. How do you fix it? Well, you weld the, the broken thing back up, but what else do you do? Add more steel. You put a doubler on it. You put a tripler on it. You put a gusset on it. What is all that doing in the context of load path? You guys familiar with load path? Sorry? Well, no, you're sending it right there. The stiffer you make something, load follows stiffness. So every time we added doublers, stiffeners, that focused more load in that area that was already overloaded. Were we fixing it, or were we making the problem worse? So it was weaker and had some flakes, but if you yes, it, flakes. that's what I'm talking about. What did? Else. Yes. Well, what uses share around somewhere else? What's a common technology that we see now every day, but it came from a certain type of racing, a certain type of car racing developed this technology. Yeah. What is Formula One? How do they design their, their uh, aluminum tubs and stuff? And even the comp composite ones now. Well, it does have crush zones and stuff like that, but I'm talking about how does it handle the design loads that it's supposed to handle without being too overstressed, without being heavy? And it spreads it around, so it's called a monocoque. Yeah, so you probably all knew that, but the reality is it's a monocoque, and that's what I said to him. Look, let's not make this stiffer. Let's make it softer, like Graham said. Let's soften this area and force the load to go somewhere else. Let's give it a different load path. And so we developed a lot of stuff. So if you look at this now, uh oh, he's this thing here. If you look at those things there, that was all developing a different load path. And you can't see it because it looks like a cutout, but there's actually a big stiff bar there that I asked him to add. And then slowly over time, we uh, transitioned that into something that carried these, um, these wheel housings so that there was a really powerful, strong load path for that, all that wheel housing loads with that 5,000 PSIs and those big rams and the forces of the tree driving through there. I gave it a load path for that so it didn't have to come up through here. So does that show in the mix? Like one solution might be a central main load path, another one would be spread it. Does that come out of the mass or do you have to have an approach starting so I can see? Is it obvious? It isn't obvious. That's the thing. It's human mind that always comes up with solutions. Computers can highlight issues and problems, but they can't really yet do that whole thing of thinking for you. So it's the human mind that says, well, what if I had another load path? What would that load path look like? In the FEA, it gives me visual evidence that the load path works so I can see well, actually, now the stress is driving over here. So there isn't one solution, maybe. There's a thousand solutions. And that's the beauty of engineering, is there's never one solution, is there? There's always a myriad of solutions. How good are we is really defined by how quickly you get to one that works. And one of the best things that I ever had in engineering, and this is when I was at Hercules. Hercules was a great learning environment for me. What they said was that, per, um, Quality is conformance to requirements. So a lot of times people will say, oh, a Porsche is much better than a Volkswagen. Is it? 
It depends what you're talking about. You're driving to a price, price point. Is a Porsche better than a Volkswagen? Yeah, for me, I would much rather spend less and have a V-Dub than have a Porsche that has a little bit better performance or a lot better performance, whatever you want to call it. My measure is not, can I do 180 Ks? My measure is not, can I pull a half a G? That doesn't matter to me. I want to know, can I get to my goal in comfort with the stereo blaring and um, not have it break down in 100,000, 200,000 kilometers. Those are my measures. So V-Dub works for me. I'm not a Porsche guy. Yeah, well, I just bought a Subaru diesel, turbo diesel. I can just uh, attest the fact that um, Greg has taken his VW uh, people mover around Ropuna and it did look like a whale. <laughs> Well, uh, let me just go to that question you just had. You know, one of the beauties of engineering, and I saw this when I was first in engineering, we, we do the Carnot cycle, we do the uh, Brayton cycle, we do, you know, remember those cycles that we all talk about? They really had me in my head, because I'm like, this diesel cycle is so much better than the auto cycle, you know, it's so much better. Why are we always driving petrol engines when this diesel is so much better? I couldn't get my head around it. And it's because the technology wasn't there. But when we got direct injection, when we got common rail diesel, when we got all these things, you guys might not remember the old crappy diesels we used to have. I've got a, a Mitsubishi Cantor motorhome that barely gets out of its own way. It's lucky if it can get out of the driveway. This thing is so underpowered, it's scary. That's not what I have now with my uh, Subaru Outback. I have a, a turbo diesel Outback that pulls like a schoolboy. You know, it's tons of fun to drive. It's six-speed tranny and it uses six kilometers or six liters per hundred case. It uses no fuel at all because that diesel cycle finally got, you know, got to its true efficiency. It says that it can be 40% efficient. Auto cycle can only be 30% efficient. There was a disparity in our technology, but there was no disparity in which was a better technology. Does that make sense? And I saw it back then, but I had no idea why it wasn't there, why it wasn't already there. And so now we have turbo diesels that are just, they're, they're brilliant, fun to drive. They don't use any fuel. I've got, I drove here in my uh, sales guy's car, which is a Hyundai turbo diesel, and it, it's so fun. I went down to uh, Pukaki last weekend to the canals, and we are doing some fishing. But the fun thing was, on the drive, I could overtake like that. There wasn't any concern. If, if I was in my old Odyssey, it would have been like, oh, I gotta have uh, good, you know, do I have enough room? It, I'm sorry? No, you're losing me there, Quentin. So, uh, have we done this one to death? Or? So yeah, that, that was something that he really didn't understand that I was able to add to the conversation and then we were able to drive this to a really good solution. So that was a, a best filler delimiter in the world in its time. Unfortunately, that company fell apart and they don't really make that anymore, but they do make other ones. Satco continued in a different format and they do make other good filler delimiters. And unfortunately, I don't, I, well, I do validate them for him, so he still gets us to do a lot of analysis for him. But unfortunately, we're not in the design side anymore. He's got his own CAD guy and, He's smart enough now, he learned all my tricks, so he does it himself. Mm -hmm.